Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest on the phone line right now, Dr. Yes, Phil. Indeed. Good morning. How's everybody? How, how are you holding What's up, up Doc? Man? How's the quarantine? How are you quarantining? Uh, well, I'm quarantining, and uh, I'm actually playing by the rules pretty well. I'm uh, <laughs> staying inside. Well, I'm going outside a lot, but I'm staying home. I haven't been anywhere at all. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question, Doc. How, what have you learned new about yourself? <laughs> well, um, I'm pretty boring, to tell you the truth. That's what <laughs> I learned. <laughs> but you know, we're so homebodies. It was like three weeks before we realized that things had changed. We don't ever go anywhere. That's how boring we are. We stay home a lot. Well, who are you quarantined right. with? Uh, who are you with? Uh, Robin. Just okay. the wife, fool. Just the two of you, his wife. I didn't know if you had some kids, kids or fair other family members or what. Who, who yeah, else some people are quarantining with their whole extended families. I know some mm -hmm. people that drove no, home to be no, with family. I got two boys that are grown, and we couldn't get them to come here with quarantine with us if you held a gun on them. <laughs> <laughs> so you haven't seen now, your Dr. grandkids or nothing, Doc? No. On Easter, they came over and uh, pulled in. They. They got out of the car and they stayed about uh, 25 or 30 feet away. They put signs on the side of the car saying "Happy Easter" and "We love you" and all of that. But they they stayed 25 or 30 feet away outside and we they danced around and played and all that. But we we maintained complete separation. Good, Dr. Phil. I saw you posted a very intriguing question that had to do with coronavirus with a woman who was having an affair. And the person that she was having an affair with contracted COVID-19. And then she had to be concerned about whether or not she passed it on to her own family at home, her husband and kids. What advice do you give somebody like that? Because this is not the time to be cheating. Yeah, that's a little hard to explain. Come home. <laughs> mm -hmm. You drag that home. That's, that's worse than an STD, right? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> depends what STD is. Well, Depend, depends what the STD is. This can kill you, you know. So I, mm -hmm. I told her, you, I don't know, I don't care if you tell them where you got it, but you damn sure need to tell them you got it. You got exposed, so you need to stay 14 days by yourself and explain that you've been exposed. Now, where, how you tell them where you got exposed is up to you, but you need to be straight up with them that you've been exposed for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, what what and advice do you give somebody? What do you what advice do you give somebody that's maybe in a relationship and they don't like their spouse right now, but they're stuck with them for fourteen days? What advice do you give them? Well, you know that's a really tough situation that's happening a lot more than people want to admit or wish was the case. And in fact, we've got a lot of people that are in abusive relationships, right. and the number one tool of the abuser is isolation. So this is their dream world. They're, they're ordered to be isolated. And I've, I've had situations where they're taking their insurance card and burning it. They're turning their phone off. So now they're mm -hmm. totally isolated and stuck with them. But, you know, this is a time where we've just got to all say, you know what? I got to put my personal agenda aside. I got to zip it and just get through this because, listen, staying isolated like this, being in quarantine like this, is really an altruistic thing. You're doing this for yourself and other people. So even if you feel like, okay, I wish it wasn't with a person I'm with, recognize you're doing this for everybody, not just for you. So don't be so selfish that you blow up because you don't like the person you're with. You got to recognize you're doing this for your neighbor. You're doing it for the elderly people. You're doing it for those people that have underlying conditions. You mentioned domestic violence, Doc. Uh, what, what's, what's the other big problems you see couples facing during this quarantine time? Well, you know, one of the big things is you, you got to look at everything in total because let's look at what's happening right now. They're, first off, a lot of people are losing their jobs. The, ec the economy is collapsing around them. So they have all of that pressure of not knowing where they're going to be able to have a job when they get out of this. And then, so they've got all that economic pressure. Then they're jammed in together 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then they're wondering if they're going to catch this virus. And if they catch the virus, how bad is it going to be for them? Not just if they're going to die or not, but how, they're worried about how sick they're going to get, have anxiety about that. And then they have the worry about our family members, particularly their parents. If they've got parents that are 60, 70, uh, years older, 
or older, are they going to die? So there's so much pressure and so much stress that it's creating a lot of physical uh, problems in addition to the mental and emotional problems. There's anxiety, depression, stress. There's a lot of loneliness for people that are staying by themselves. So all of these pressures, this is just a perfect storm of bad elements of stress and pressure that's causing people to have mental emotional problems and then it translates into physical problems because for example people that are lonely uh, this translates into uh, increased likelihood of dementia if you're in that age bracket if you have cancer mortality goes up 25 percent if you wow. are if you're lonely and have cancer and for people that have underlying disorders uh, which can happen at all ages, then you've really got susceptibility to this disorder. And as you guys know, that happens disproportionately with the black community. I'm, I want to ask you a question from a production standpoint uh, when it comes to TV. How much is too much coronavirus content for you? Because you're on daily. <clears throat> You know, I think everybody is watching this too much. I'm telling everybody, if you want to maintain some mental health, you've got to watch this. Maybe find a source you trust and watch this for 30 minutes in the morning. Get caught up on what's happening. And then maybe check in 30 minutes in the evening. And then you need to turn the damn television off. Turn the radio mm -hmm. off. Get on to other things because people are getting obsessed with this. And let me tell you, the news never goes on the air and says, hey, today at 3rd and, and Elm, nothing happened. Right. <laughs> all of the bad stuff, you know, all the death, all the destruction, all the sensationalistic headlines. They don't talk about how many people survived, how many people resolved this, what progress is being made. They just talk about all the death and how many people contracted it. So you get a biased view that's very negative. Now, Dr. Well, yes, Phil, the Catch Me Outside girl, right? I, I just call her the Catch Me Outside girl, bad baby. When's the last time you spoke with her, if you spoke with her, or her peoples, or her family, or her mom, or anything at all? The last time she was on my stage. <laughs> He's like, they always ask me this. I am over it. <laughs> and you like to keep it like that, huh? <laughs> that's right. That's, uh, that's, that's not my finest hour. That's not something I'm particularly <laughs> proud of. Yeah, that's your All fault, right, so Dr. Phil. You, you, the, 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 the virus known as Catch Me Outside Girl started with you. We should call it the Phil virus. <laughs> that's right. And I confess, I'm, I'm guilty. <laughs> <laughs> I have so no defense. I don't even try to do it. A lot of people are trying to stay healthy right now, too, as far as making sure they do some movement. Because people aren't wanting to go outside, but you got to exercise in the house. If you don't have exercise equipment or a lot of space... What's some advice that you give to people when it comes to working out at home? Well, there's two ways that you've got to look at this. And I am, I am so concerned that nobody, I can't get people to listen as much as I wish about the mental and emotional issues that are associated with this disease, because I, I really believe in the long term that there is going to be as much disruption and destruction to quality of life and perhaps as much loss of life across time, not, not right now today, but across time uh, from this virus, from the mental emotional aspects as there is from the virus itself. And there are two things that you have to do. And one is to reduce your stress. And part of that is in exercise. And then the other is just exercise itself, which does help with the stress, but it also keeps your immune system healthy. Um, I, I tell people if, <clears throat> excuse me, if you can take 10 minutes a day, two times, and during that 10 minutes, you can just, de just try to get rid of the tension in your body. And but you can do that by just tensing up every muscle in your body for 10 seconds and then relax. Then 10 seconds tense and then relax and do that 10 times in a row. And then breathing, breathe in for three seconds and out for six. In for three, out for six. And do that 10 times in a row. So the oxygen carbon dioxide exchange rate is two to one. If you can do those two things, tense and relax and do that breathing, 
each of them 10 times in a row, twice a day, the effects of that last for eight hours. 10 mm -hmm. minutes last for eight hours in getting your stress levels down. Because look, we have this fight or flight reaction, which is where we get when we're under threat. And that's supposed to last for seconds. That's what you do when you hear something behind you in a dark alley at night. You know, you get all up ready to go into fight or flight. It's not supposed to last for days, weeks, or months, which is what it's doing now. And that causes organ breakdown. It causes all kinds of issues. But if you can do what I'm saying here, that really brings that back down to baseline. And then if you can exercise, whether it's just really going up and down the, the steps. If you got two, three steps to your apartment building, run up and down those. If you can just walk to the corner and back. I mean, anything that you can do to get your, get your pulse rate up, get your heart rate up, it helps if you can just do it for even 10 or 15 minutes a couple times a day. And also sleep. I like sleep, they say, is very important. You got to get enough sleep because that repairs your body. There is nothing more important than sleep. If there was one thing that you were going to let me control to drive somebody insane, it would be sleep. If you, if you get sleep deprivation, your body starts breaking down, your mental emotional health starts breaking down, your, your ability to handle stress, your immune, your immune system breaks down, everything goes to hell if your sleep goes out the window. I wanted to ask you about uh, mental health again, Doc, because, you know, what you said about the news is, was, 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 was very dope to me because I feel like we watch the news because we're looking for answers, but they really haven't figured it out yet. So being that they haven't figured it out yet, it causes more confusion, which causes more anxiety. Well, it does. It causes a lot of anxiety because you hear one thing one minute and it's like, do you wear a mask? No, you don't wear a mask. And then yep. <laughs> do, we have, do, do we have testing? Do we do not have testing? Uh, are you, if you get this, uh, is it going to be fatal? Is it going to be serious, right. not serious? You get mm -hmm. all these mixed messages and then you start out initially, uh, you know, some people could get it. Some people couldn't get it. You have all of these rumors flying around out there. And then you have all of these, these idiots that come out with these fake protocols that supposedly are going to fix you do this do that and you'll be okay that people put on the internet they're just they're just idiots and it causes people to have false hope and then they lose that when they find out it was all a lie and it's just creating anxiety and anxiety makes us more vulnerable to to contracting the the virus don't you have a I show about that the, mu the miracle cures and scams and what might really treat coronavirus isn't that one yeah. an upcoming episode Yes, it's coming up, and we're and we've got people on from uh, the California Insurance Enforcement Board who talk about all the scams. And let me tell you, you talk about jerks. These people are showing up on people's front porches, knocking on the door, and saying, "Hey, your insurance is going to be canceled. You won't have any coverage if you get this virus. So you need to pay us two hundred fifty dollars so your insurance isn't canceled." Not only are they preying on the elderly and getting money from them on the front porch. But while they're on the front porch getting that 250 bucks, their Confederate is around the back of the house, breaking in the back door wow. and robbing them. Damn. Now, how Damn. bad is that? That's awful. Damn. I wanted to ask you something about um, porn right now, because a lot of people are watching porn at home. They're talking oh. about the numbers going up. So what do you tell people is too much porn? Is there any danger in people now if they're not doing much and they're at home and watching porn all day? Is that something that is dangerous? You know, that depends on the couple. If, if the couple has talked about it and they've decided that that's an okay thing that they share together or maybe she's happy that that's taking pressure off of her, I mean, that's what they've negotiated. That's one thing. But if one of them looks at the other as being that's cheating, that that's betrayal, that that's an insult, then that can really create problems. And trust me, there are couples out there more than you would think that believe that that is tantamount to cheating. And so they feel betrayed when their partner defaults to that instead of to them. Now, some people don't look at it that way. They look at it as like, Hey, great. Turn it on. We'll party. And then there are those that look at it as absolute betrayal. So it depends on what the couple has negotiated and what they have agreed to between themselves. 
Uh, but it's certainly the statistics show that Netflix and porn are definitely <laughs> getting an awful lot of attention now, right now. Now, we had this conversation a, a week ago. <laughs> are, are dildos essential, Dr. Phil? We had this conversation on air a couple of days ago. Are dildos uh, essential right now? Lord have mercy. To who? <laughs> you asking for to yourself? Him. He's, asking, he's asking for himself, Doc. He, he um, has a personal question. <laughs> yeah, there was a, there was a rumor there, there was a oh, rumor that uh, he go. he got caught with he got caught with this guy talking about nine and a half inch dildos. He's asking for himself, sir. Doctor Phil, don't let, believe you, everything you say. You should have let me ask that question, but go ahead. You're right. <laughs> yeah. So nine and a half. So you were going for the small ones. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> oh, th- thanks. <laughs> <laughs> th- thanks, Doc. Hey, thanks. thanks. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you a question, Doc. What what will normal look like after this? To what do you think normal will look like? Well, I, I think that there's going to be, to use the cliche, a new normal. Could, because I think when they ring the bell and open the gates, and I don't know when that's going to be, but it depends on who you're talking about. Like for example, when you're talking about essential workers. Um, there's not going to be a big difference because for essential workers, uh, only 37% of the population is able to work at home. And those that cannot work at home, only one in five uh, black or brown workers are able to work at home. And, and 65, 66% of white workers in the top quartile of the earning group are able to work at home. So it's going to be different for those two categories. You look at the bottom quarter of the earning range and the top quarter of the earning range, it's going to be very different because the essential workers that are in the bottom quarter of the earning range, it's not going to be a lot different for them because they haven't been able to stay home. They've been going to work every single day what the hell's the difference for them they might wear a mask but they've been going to work and those people need to be applauded they first off they need to be protected which they're not but they should be applauded and for them there's not going to be a lot of difference for others it's going to be i think very scary and i think it's going to be very slow i don't think when the bell rings people are going to go racing out their door and you know, head to a Yankee game and go to a Broadway play or go hang out in a club. I think people are going to be very nervous about this for a period of time. And it's going to be a slow stepwise sort of thing with a lot of uh, anxiety and paranoia. But the paranoia is going to be actually justified because I think people are going to be concerned. This isn't just the flu. It really is different. The the lethality of this is 10 to 20 times that of the common flu. And so this does have a bigger impact than, than what we've seen for a long, long time. So there is a big difference. And I think people are going to be very nervous when they go back out there. Right. I was going to say, Dr. No, Phil, how it. are you taping your show? How, how is your show coming together? Cause I know you can't be around people is it, you, you should be quarantining. So how, how are you taping your show? Well, you know, CBS came in, I, I, I shoot on a Paramount lot, and um, as Charlemagne knows, we're a, a, we have a big soundstage there with a lot of, a big audience, like, you know, 250 people, and they came in and said, look, this has gotten to the point that we're going to have to uh, shut down. So, you know, first we shot without an audience, and then we shot with all of our people working from home. But then they came in and said, no, we're going to have to lock down Paramount. So we're just going to have to wrap for the season and just call it quits. But, you know, I thought, I can't do that. I mean, with what I do, which is dealing with mental and emotional issues and strain, Mm -hmm. this is the last time in the world I should disappear. Mm -hmm. So I'm shooting from home. That's, That's where I am right now. And I've got a I've got a one person crew and that's Robin. She does hair, makeup, <laughs> cameras, lighting. Uh, she's become quite a tech, you know, she just wears a baseball cap and a tool belt and she's climbing all over the place. Uh, I'm trying to get her to wear only that, but she hasn't gone for that yet. But <laughs> Yay, Dr. Phil, keep it spicy. <laughs> We're shooting everything right here from home. And then my, my team, 
they're all shooting from their houses and working from their houses and we're using these zoom sessions. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm, I, I did a show the other day. I, I talked to a guest from an apartment in New York. The next guest was in an apartment in Beijing. So I'm able to link up with people all over the country and in the world and do the same things that I normally do. We just don't have the video packages. We don't have, you know, all the bells and whistles that we would normally have, but um, you know, we're still able to have the conversation, answer mm -hmm. the questions, talk about the things that are on people's minds. Gotcha. Now we need your voice right now because you're a doctor and, and, and I wanted to ask you, how do you feel when you see government officials dismissing the, the, the information that's coming from the medical experts. When you see Donald Trump, you know, retweet stuff about Dr. Fauci and how he needs to be fired, how does that make you as a, a medical professional feel? Well, it just drives me crazy. Because, look, the, the politicians need to shut up and let the scientists speak. The politicians don't have any more idea in a goose what's going on. The scientists are the ones that are dealing with this. They're the ones that have a 30 or 40 year history. The coronavirus is not new. This is a novel coronavirus, but the coronavirus family has been around since the 50s. There are people that have worked with this forever. There are people now that know what has to happen to do this, this convalescent serum, to use the antibodies, to do what's necessary for the human testing for a vaccine. They know how long it takes. And then politicians get up and politicize this. I just want to scream when they do it. They need to shut up and let people talk that know what they're doing. Absolutely. You think we're getting closer to, to, to being, to, to this being behind us like they're saying? They're saying that the worst is behind us? I think the worst is behind us because we've done what we've done. And I think the models, when the models came out and said originally, and there's still some people out there like Zeke Emanuel, who's, they call him Dr. Death, who says we need to be locked down for 18 months and said there were going to be a million deaths, two million deaths. I never believed that. And I went on record and I said, I thought it was going to be more like 60 to 80,000. And I think that that's more likely going to be the case because we've done what we've done, because right. we have gone into a shelter at home. And that lets this run its course for a while. And I think we can start to open the country back up with modifications and, and maintaining certain social distancing, you know, wearing masks, doing different things that we haven't done before. But I think we have kind of hit the apex. It seems to be flattening out, but at a very bad rate. I mean, you've seen 2,500 people die yesterday. Mm -hmm. But there comes a point where you do have to recognize that there's a tipping point where you're going to lose more people to economic issues, mental emotional issues, and poverty than you are from the virus itself. We That's lose right. 480,000 people a year due to, to car accidents, but we still use cars. Right. I mean, they're a convenience, but we still use them. We use eight, lose 80,000 people a year to alcohol, uh, just by alcohol toxicity, but there's still alcohol being sold. We don't shut the country mm -hmm. down for that. How long can we shut the country down for this and collapse the economy? 250,000 people a year die in America from poverty. That's from starving, exposure to the elements, lack of proper medical care. That's 700 people a day die from poverty. And that's going to skyrocket if we don't get the economy turned back on. You just have to do it in a responsible way at a responsible right. time. Right. I want, this is my last question. Um, Cause you know, I know that you sit down and you talk to queen Oprah a lot and y'all have deep conversations about life. So I want to ask you, what are your instincts telling you about this current situation? What do you think God and the universe are trying to tell us about all of this? Well, look, I, I think we really get wake up calls from time to time. And, you know, to me, I look at this as, putting a real spotlight on the inequities in our workplace. And I, I see that those that are in the low socioeconomic strata 
and that includes a lot of black and brown, as you know. Look how disproportionate this is uh, with that community. In Milwaukee, uh, 26% of the population is black and brown, but 81% of the deaths. Uh, in Louisiana, 33% of the population, 70% of the deaths. Um, and people say you, you can't, you're not going to catch it anymore likely if you're in that low economic strata, but that's just absolutely not true. Your likelihood of catching it are two and a half times greater. And then your likelihood of winding up on a ventilator are four times greater. So this is just, again, showing that there is this, this systemic implicit bias against those that are either black, brown, or poor in our country that just don't have the same uh, opportunities for health care and protection in society that the rest of us do. And that is screaming from the statistics, and nobody's talking about it. What the hell That's right. is going on? Right. What That's the right. hell is going on? It's just, right. it's insane to me. It's insane to me. And, and they say, why are they catching it more? Well, I'll tell you what, because they're essential workers and they're, have you seen the number pictures, the number two train coming out of Harlem where it's, it's just packed with essential workers. Mm -hmm. They don't have the cars to drive to work. So yes, they're on the train. Uh, why do you think they're on the train? Cause we need them to run the country and we're not providing them ways to get to work safely. Uh, that's why they're catching it, you idiots. These people keep asking those questions like they don't understand. They're idiots. It's very obvious to me. And, and, so you, and you don't so get the same quality of care. If you're poor, you don't get the same quality of care. Whatever color your skin is, if you're poor, you don't get the same quality of care. Right. So basically what you're saying is it's exposing what we all know, which is systemic racism. To me, racism is the greatest disease America has never found a cure for. Well, it is damn sure an underlying condition. You know, people keep saying, if you have an underlying condition, then this disease is much more deadly. And systemic racism is an underlying condition. Not to mention that within that population is a higher incidence of diabetes, obesity, hypertension, which are medical underlying conditions. But then the Im implicit and explicit bias is also an underlying condition. <laughs> They don't get as much time with doctors. There's not as much attention from doctors. There's not the care available. The healthcare system is not as available. There is an underlying condition systemically, and then there are also physical underlying conditions that make this uh, more deadly for that population. And those underlying conditions are more prevalent in that population because of the systemic racism. Right. You heard it from Dr. Phil. America ain't gonna Thank never you, be Dr. shit Phil. till they do right by black people. All right. Well, Dr. Phil, thank you, for, right. thank for, you. for joining us this morning, man. We appreciate yes. it. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Phil. Give so our love to your wife as well. I, I certainly do it. And thank you guys for continuing to turn a spotlight on all of this. I, I appreciate thank it. You, uh, thank you for having me on. It's my honor. All thank right. you. Thank you so Always. much. Dr. Appreciate Phil, it's the Breakfast Club. Good morning. <laughs>